Hello and welcome to Introduction to Research Data Management. My name is Stacy Winchester and I'm the Research Data Management Librarian with University Libraries at the University of South Carolina. My job is to help researchers preserve, share, and find data for research, so I'm very excited to talk to you about research data management and how it can help you manage your data. Today we're going to take a whirlwind tour through some basics of data management. If you're somebody who already has a lot of experience managing data, this might include some review, but um, viewers of this tutorial might come with a wide variety of experience levels, and I'm hoping that it's going to include something new for everyone. Data management covers a lot of ground, so what I'm going to do is focus on some simple strategies that you can use to manage research data, most of which are also going to translate into good practices to use with your personal data as well. So when we talk about managing research data, what do we even mean? Data management is a commonly used term, and it means a lot of things. Um, generally, when I talk about research data management, I'm talking about future proofing your research data to make sure that it will remain um, findable, accessible, and reusable by future you if you want to reuse your data down the road or by others with whom you might want to or need to share that data. Um, data management means a lot of things, and so today we're going to focus on a few practices that translate across disciplines. We'll talk about storing and backing up data, documenting your data to add context and make it more useful. We're going to talk about organizing data files, selecting file formats for long-term data preservation, and um, if desired or required by you, we're going to talk about sharing your data. Then we'll talk briefly about data management plans. DMPs are documents that lay out how you're going to consistently collect and preserve your research data during and after your project. And there are required part um, by many funders of the grant application process. Whether or not you're planning to apply for a grant though, they're a great way to plan for the management of your research data in order to help you save time and effort down the road, enhance the value and usefulness of your data, and make it easier to share, which can increase your impact. So let's start out by talking a little bit about storing and backing up data. Um, we'll talk about a basic sort of rule for storing and backing up data to make sure that you don't lose access to it. It's called the 321 rule. You might also have heard of a rule that is similar called the here, near, far rule. So the gist of it is this. Um, some data, if you lose it, it, it's not a big deal. However, for other types of data, if you lose access to it, like let's say, for example, it's the data that you're collecting for your dissertation. Um, let's say it's your, your dissertation file itself. Let's say it's data you're collecting as part of a federally funded grant. That's the kind of data that you must not lose access to. So for data that you cannot lose, um, it's a good idea to keep three copies of your data with two copies being backups that are stored on different storage media and one of them is located offsite. So let's break that down a little bit. Um, we would probably all agree that for data that it's really important that we don't lose, um, it's a good idea to keep more than one copy of it. For example, if you just had a copy on your laptop and your laptop is stolen or you left it in an Uber, uh, that would be kind of disastrous. So you can keep a copy on your laptop, but you can also keep a couple of other copies updated. Um, and if you have three copies of your data, then it's very likely that all of those media are going to fail. The one copy that is located offsite is likely to be a copy that you're storing in the cloud. There are a lot of different ways that you can accomplish the 321 rule, um, but what I mostly want to do when I share this slide with people is just get you thinking about um, storing and backing up your data to make sure that you do not find yourself in a disastrous situation where you've only kept one copy of your data and now um, you know, you're not able to access it anymore. 
And if you are a researcher who is planning to apply for grant funding, you'll actually need a pretty good idea of how and where and when you're going to store and back up your data even before you're funded. Because I mentioned data management plans. Storage and backup method are commonly something that you have to describe in one of those documents. So it's a really good idea to have some idea of how you're going to do it ahead of time. The 321 rule for storing and backing up data is great for a lot of the different kinds of data that we collect, um, that we create in our jobs uh, while we're doing research, but I do want to mention regulated data. Regulated data is data that includes sensitive information, could be personally identifying information about subject uh, participants or data that for some other ethical or legal reason should not be shared and that requires high, higher levels of security than other data types. Types of regulated data could include, for example, FERPA data, so student data, um, HIPAA data, that's health data, social security numbers, um, financial data that's covered by the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act or payment card industry data security standards. Again, it could be sensitive, identifiable human subject research data or export control research, so national security data. These types of data um, require additional levels of security, and the way you treat that data may very well depend on where you're getting the data, who your funder is, it's important that you work with IRB, the Institutional Review Board at, uh, at the institution to make sure that you have a good plan for working with this data. So this isn't the kind of data that you would store a copy in the cloud, for example. Um, you will be very careful with it. For more information about um, regulated data, feel free to contact me. You'll see that my, um, my contact information is available at the end of this tutorial. Okay, so let's switch gears again. Let's say that you're, you're working on a research project and um, you're collecting data, you have a plan to properly store that data and back it up. Here's another step that you can take to make sure that your data remain useful for yourself down the road or for others with whom you might want to or need to share the data. Um, I have a slide here that says data documentation and below it, it says readme.txt. A data documentation file is a type of metadata file. Metadata are data that describe other data. And a data documentation file is a file that you include in your uh, directory of research data files in order to provide context so that you can go back to your data down the road and remember what you did for it, how you, what you did with it. Um, it's a good idea to call this data documentation file read me. When you look in a directory of files and you see a file in that directory that says read me, you can say, oh, okay, you know what, before I attempt to do anything else with these files, I need to open that read me file because it's going to give me some context so that I'll know how to utilize the data. So it could include data collection methodology, um, structure and organization of data files, data validation or quality assurance measures taken, um, it could be a description of the manipulations that were done to the data. Um, it could be information about confidentiality or access or use conditions that go along with the data. You could describe variable names. Um, you could elaborate on definitions of codes or classification schemes. You can include information about missing values or definitions of specialty terminology or acronyms that may not be familiar to those um, outside of the original research group. You could describe algorithms or file format and software used. There's a lot of different things that you can include in one of these files. We'll see an example of one in just a little bit. So here is what data documentation could look like. Um, as you can see, uh, it is just some descriptive information. This particular data documentation file includes comments and includes the software that was used during the course of the research. It includes the contact information for the original research team. So maybe this documentation file is something that was included in, um, in a, 
a directory of files that were submitted to a data repository. We'll talk a little bit more about data repositories in just a bit. And in fact, I can kind of see that this was because up at the top of the back slide, the one that's behind, I see Dataverse. Dataverse is a research data repository. This data was publicly shared. And so when a, someone finds the data and they want to reuse it for their own purposes, they can open this README file and get a little context to help them understand. Okay, we're going to switch uh, gears just a little bit once again, and we're going to talk about organizing data. One important way to organize your data and make it useful is by using consistent file naming. Uh, have you ever had this experience? I bet you have. You know you've saved a file, but you can't find it. Or you're looking through files in a directory and you cannot tell what is in those files. That definitely happened to me in the past. In fact, it still does occasionally. But since I've learned these rules for organizing files by using consistent file naming, it's really helped me. So let's say that you are um, you know, creating a file maybe one of many, many files because you're working on research and um, you want to make sure that when you preserve your files, you're able to come back to them later and know what was in them. I have some pr best practices for file naming. Um, there are a lot of potential elements that you might include in a file name. You know, you've started typing and you, you hit save, and now you need to give the, the file a name. You might include, depending on the kind of file that you're creating, um, the file creator's name or initials. You might include the date of creation. We're gonna talk a little bit more about using dates consistently. I know that's one that I use pretty regularly. And if you're, you know, let's say you're doing interviews, let's say you're collecting images over time, dates can be a really great, um, way to organize files. You might be um, recording or collecting more than one version of a file. Um, you might so you might include that in in your file name. Um, you might include a project or experiment name or acronym in your file name um, or something else about the type of data. So here are some best practices for naming files consistently and in a way that's going to give them context. The first thing we're going to discuss is length. Um, you want your file to contain enough contextual information to give you an idea of what is in it without having it be too long. So the best practice here says to limit this to 32 characters or fewer. Um, this is a commonly used best practice, and I have adapted this slide for our use today from, from another source. Um, I have a list of best practices and then a list of examples. So in the examples column, you see... 32 characters looks exactly like this .csv. That's a pretty long file name. You would, I would suggest that you might even want your file names, if possible, to be a little shorter than that, because you want to be able to look at your file name and have some sort of idea what's in it. The next um, suggestion or best practice contains a couple of ideas that you probably heard about and one idea that maybe maybe you haven't heard about before. So the first that I'll mention is when you are creating a file name, do not attempt to include special characters such as the ampersand, asterisk, dollar sign, that sort of thing. Now, it's actually very likely that you will not be able to even make a file that has any of these special characters in it. And the reason that your computer doesn't want you to be able to do that is because um, for some operating systems, these characters might be um, interpreted as an instruction to perform a task. So we definitely do not want our file names to include characters that tell the operating system to do something, right? That would probably at the very least render the file unopenable or you know, who knows, maybe something worse. So it's very likely that you can't even do that. But if you can, that is why we don't. You also do not want to include extra full stops or periods in your file name, except the one that comes right before the file extension, right? Because your computer, um, your, you know, it's your machine's going to look at that and expect to see the file extension after the period. So don't attempt to put full periods or extra periods. 
And the third one, this is the one you maybe haven't heard of before, is not to use spaces in your file name. Now, um, this isn't necessarily important for all the files you create. So for example, lots of files you're creating on your computer, you probably do use spacing when you're creating file names, and it's probably fine because you're not necessarily preserving all of these files long term for potential reuse in the future, um, maybe in ways that you cannot currently guess at, and you're not um, necessarily going to be sharing all of these files that you're creating on your computer um, with other people who might use the data for purposes that you cannot guess. However, when you're performing research, it may be the case that you do need to preserve it long term and reuse it in the future for things you can't even guess at right now. And it may be that you need to share the data and other people are going to be using the data. If that is the case, if you're preserving your data long term, the best practice is not to use spaces. So why is that? Um, I have a personal, uh, a bit of personal experience with this. Um, the reason we do not want to use spaces is because it can cause issues when working in the command line and some software packages cannot read files that have spaces in the names. This happened to me. I was working with library data and I was working with a lot of files that were created years ago and they all had spaces in them. I was using an open source software and that software that I was using to perform a task couldn't read spaces with file names or file names with spaces, sorry. So I had to, to batch edit all of those uh, file names to remove the spaces. Okay, so if you're not using spaces in file names, what do you do instead? Um, on the right side in the examples column, I have a few, a couple of suggestions. Um, the first is a no, do not do this. My space cool space file dot txt. You know, that's a, a potential file name. It's fine, generally speaking, to use spaces, not if you're preserving it long term or sharing it. So what would you do instead? There are a couple of suggestions. The first, and this is the one that I kind of like the best, um, is called camel case. As you can see, that first suggestion in the yes uh, example column is my, and the words are smooshed together with no spaces, and the first letters of the second and third word are capitalized, which is kind of why we call it camel case. It makes a little hump in the word. Mycoolfile.txt. You could also, instead of using spaces, you could use hyphens or underscores. So here's another example, my-cool-file.txt. I have found that a lot of times um, when I'm using a software that can't really read um, file names that have spaces in them, it automatically puts a dash between or a hyphen in between each word. So those are just some ideas. Okay, so now let's talk about dates. I mentioned to you that dates are a really great way to um, create files in a manner that allows them to display within your directory in a certain order. So let's say that I took a series of images, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's 700 images that I took as part of research and it's, I take one each day or I take one, um, you know, each week. Um, in a case like that, having dates at the beginning of the file name can be a really great way of making those dates appear chronologically in the directory. However, if you're going to use dates when creating a file name, the key is to use a consistent date format. Uh, that'll help you understand that you're looking at a date and it'll help those files sort. So in the example column, it says YYYYMMDD is good. So the international standard for using dates is called ISO 8601. And you do not need to know very much about ISO 8601, but I guarantee you, you're already familiar with it because at its simplest, um, ISO 8601 says, hey, if you're recording a date, you should record it as year, 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 month, month, day, day. And if we all do it that way, then we'll all be recording consistently. So for example, 
if I made a file on January 20, January 1st, 2024, it would be 2024-0101. And of course you have seen that before. We'll, we'll talk just a little bit more about dates momentarily. And another important um, file naming and organization best practice has to do with numbering, particularly when you're talking about version numbers. So the best practice is to use leading zeros to allow for multi-digit versions when using sequential numbering. It's going to keep your files in the intended order. So for example, in, in the example column, we see a no example, which is project ID V1. So what happens if you have, you know, 12 um, different versions by the time you're done and you want to keep all of them? You want to store all of them in the directory. The best practice is to instead use project ID V01. That's going to help your files continue to display in sequential order. The same thing kind of goes for um, folder structures. Uh, the first thing to know about folder structures is you should definitely utilize folders. Um, it's a good way of organizing your data files, right? Put, them, put the information into different folders um, categorized in a way that makes sense for your research. Uh, you want to select folder names that provide context without being too long. And if you're looking for a file within project folders, um, you do not want to have too many subfolders. And we have a kind of an extreme example of that on the side here, right? We've got a sub, 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 subfolder. Um, you probably wouldn't want your folder structure to go quite that deep if possible because it's going to make it very difficult to find the needed file if you're clicking and clicking and clicking through uh, subfolders in order to find the one you're looking for. Now I want to take a little bit of time to talk to you about uh, <clears throat> another issue that's important. So another concept that you need to be thinking about, if you are preserving data long term and potentially sharing the data with other people, is the file format that you collect and save your data in. So here on the screen, we have a little chart um, and it's got file types you know, things you might expect, text, spreadsheet, video, a presentation, maybe sound files. And then we've got two more columns, proprietary and open. Um, this is a slightly misleading slide. So let me explain what I mean by proprietary versus open. And then we'll talk about why it's a little bit misleading, but why I think that it still um, includes a good lesson. So there are probably a lot of different ways that we could categorize file types, right? But um, one of those ways is whether the file type is proprietary or open source. A proprietary file type is one that's owned by a company. For example, Word is open is owned by Microsoft. Um, you know, Windows Media Player Windows uh, is is a proprietary software. Um, an open format is a file format for which the code is available, the code that kind of underlies the file format. And an open file format is a type of format which almost any computer can open. So above proprietary, I have a big, big red X, which suggests that I am saying that you should not use Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel when you do your research. And above the open file format um, equivalent, I have a big green check which suggests that I'm saying that you should use that instead. And I'm actually not. Um, of course, we're all going to probably use Word. We're very likely all going to use Excel. Uh, that's at least for now. That, those are basically the go-to um, file formats, the, the go-to systems that you might use to save files. However, if you are collecting data that you're going to preserve long term and might need to share with other people who will be doing something with that data, the best practice is when an open format equivalent exists 
So for example, instead of a Microsoft Excel.xls document, saving it as a .csv document, when that opportunity exists, best practice is to definitely save a version of the file that way. Because you might be coming back to your data in 10 years and you might be operating under the assumption that the, um, that the software that you used when you created the file is still going to be available to you, but it might not. For example, in the 1990s, I used a um, word processing program that really no longer exists. If I went back to my floppy drive from 1992, if I could find a way to even read a floppy drive, um, I would find probably that I couldn't open the file because I no longer have the correct software. In this day and age, we are less likely to purchase software that is ours to keep permanently and more likely to have to subscribe to software. For example, a subscription to Microsoft, you know, Office Suite. Um, for these reasons, you might not have at some point in the future access to the same file format if you want to reuse your data in 10 years. Also, if you're, say, if you're sharing your data, you might be sharing it with someone who's running a different operating system. Maybe they live in a different part of the world and something about the software that they use is different there. Or they might be doing something with the software or with the file that you can't begin to guess. For that reason, the best practice is to save when it is possible a copy of the file in an open format. If you're somebody who wants to or needs to share your data files in a research data repository, they will probably want you to give them those files in an open format. They also might make the migration for you, but you probably need to find out um, what their preference is ahead of time. So, with all of that said, we've talked about rules for uh, best practices for naming files. Um, for using folders. We've talked about best practices for um, file types. Now you'll have the opportunity to see some examples of this. On the screen, we have a fictitious directory of files um, that some researcher has created. I'm gonna stop talking for just a moment if you need longer, just pause the recording. What you're going to do is take a look at the, the different files and folders that are in this directory and think about what the researcher did well and what they could have done better. Okay, um, hopefully if you needed more time, you have paused the, the slide so that you can take a bit more, more time to look at it. Let's talk about things that this researcher <clears throat> did well. I see a few. For example, I see that the researcher has used folders, right? Um, that really helps in this case. The background folder probably includes, um, I'm gonna guess by looking at the file names, articles that the researcher is going to use for a lit review. They've got a data file where they actually have their research data stored, and they also have a meetings file. And I'm betting um, by looking at these file names that they are probably meeting notes or meeting minutes. I see that this researcher does not have spaces in their file names. If that um, no spaces in the file names rule was when you hadn't heard before, now that you have heard it, you will probably start to see that everywhere. And you see it here as well. We've got some um, where there's just no spaces. We've got a couple where there's an underscore um, instead of a space. So these are all good. I also see in the data folder a readme file. So 10 years from now, if that researcher wants to reuse this data for some other purpose, they can go to that readme file and get a little bit of context. If they're sharing the files, the, uh, the directory of files with a colleague, that colleague can read the readme files and understand the data a little bit better. Those are all good. So let's talk about some things that the researcher could have done a little bit better. Um, in the background folder, You'll notice that the file names are not very descriptive. Um, in fact, some of them are just kind of gibberish. 
So I'm a librarian, and when I download a, an article from um, a database at the library, often I get a file name that looks kind of like that first one. It's a bunch of characters. Part of it might be a year. Who knows? Um, when I download a, a article from the university library subscriptions, um, I rename it. And that's what this person should have done as well. I can see that they did rename a couple of them. They named one download.pdf. They renamed one interesting article.pdf. Um, and that is a renamed file, I'm guessing, but it's really not very descriptive. When the, when the researcher downloaded interesting article.pdf, they probably thought, oh, you know what? This is interesting and I will definitely remember what this article is, but let's face it, they won't, um, you wouldn't and neither would I. So you might instead consider renaming the article in a way that makes sense for you. You know, maybe it's depending on your needs, maybe it's part of the author, the lead author's name. Maybe it's something about um, the subject covered in the in the article or the experiment that was performed, but something that gives you a little bit of idea what's actually in it. Now let's talk about those meeting notes. Upon first glance, one might think, oh, hey, this is a good thing. Um, the researcher used dates to make their meeting notes appear chronologically. And indeed, it does appear that they attempted to use dates. But when you look more closely, you'll notice that those dates do not appear chronologically because this researcher has not consistently used a date format. So for example, we have 3 2 2018. Is that March 2nd, 2018? I'm guessing it is. Um, it appears in the directory below 04 2218. It's a different date format. Um, chronologically, it would make more sense for an April. I'm assuming it's an April meeting, 04, 02, 18. Um, I'm guessing that's April 2nd, but maybe it's not. Chronologically, it should appear below a March meeting, right? But they didn't use a consistent date format. Are they even dates? As you start looking at some of these uh, file names, you be, might begin to wonder that. Uh, some of the uh, files in this directory are, um, are using an open format and some of them are not. Um, that may be okay and it may be a situation where it would be a good idea for the researcher to have used an open format, um, particularly if they need to um, share those meeting notes for some reason with someone else who might, for example, be running a different operating system. So I hope that this slide provided you with um, some examples of how what we talked about works in real life. OK, so I've talked off and on throughout this recording about sharing data, preserving data long term and sharing it. So how do you know if you need to preserve and share your research data? And if you do need to preserve and share your research data, when do you do that? How do you do that? And where do you do that? And who can even help you find the answer to the question? Now, if you're at the University of South Carolina and you're asking yourself this question, I am a good person for you to contact. Again, my job is research data librarian and helping researchers preserve their data is part of my job. That contact information will be at the end of the recording. So again, if you want to talk to me about finding a data repository that's appropriate for your research data, we can definitely have that conversation. Now, why might you want to share your research data? Uh, the first and foremost reason that people do this is because their funding agency requires them to. The NSF, that's the National Science Foundation, um, the National Institutes of Health or NIH, and many other funding agencies require when it is ethically and legally reasonable to do so, they require funded researchers to share not just the article that results from their research, but also um, the research data that underlies that research. 
This um, is for a couple of reasons. It's a good return on taxpayer investment, because remember, if you're doing federally funded research, you are using tax dollars, and that research data could potentially be reused for another really great purpose. Uh, you might also want to share your research data because you would like to increase your impact as a researcher. So that could happen in a couple of different ways. If you are somebody who makes your research data publicly available, someone else might reuse it in their own research and they will cite you. And every researcher likes to be cited. It's very important. It could also increase opportunities for collaboration. So for example, another researcher could see your data and say, oh, hey, this is somebody that I should be working with. You might also want to share your research data in the spirit of openness and reproducibility and innovation. Um, researchers are more and more commonly making the article that results from their research available through open access. Open access means that anybody can open that article and read it and it doesn't live behind a paywall. You can do the same with your research data when it makes sense to do so. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about when it doesn't make sense to do so. But if you um, openly release not just your article, but also your research data, it will make it easier for another team to go behind you and reproduce that research um, to make sure that it is reproducible. It can also sort of, you know, spur innovation. Um, other teams, other researchers might use your data for a purpose you haven't even thought about to create something wonderful. Now, not all research data are good for sharing. Remember, we talked about that regulated sensitive data. data, data that contain personally identifying information about research subjects or for any other ethical or legal reason should not be made publicly available is obviously not a good contender for sharing. In many cases, if you are getting funding to do that research from a federal funding agency, you might be asked to anonymize your data so that none of the personal information is included and then share it. And sometimes that is reasonable and sometimes it is not reasonable. So ultimately you and maybe your funding agency uh, will be the ones who decide whether your data should be shared. If you do want to or need to share your data, there are a lot of different places that you can do it. They are called research data repositories. Data repositories are generally open access repositories where you can search for and access digital data. Data repositories might be run by a funding agency. They might be disciplinary uh, in nature. So everybody in that discipline knows to go to a specific data repository where they share their data and others in the in the field can find it. Data repositories can be institutional. Lots of universities have their own research data repository. Currently at the University of South Carolina, we do not have one, although we do provide access to lots of places where you can share research data. And research data repositories can also be generalist in nature. And I have several of those listed on the screen here, like some that you may have heard of, Dataverse, Figshare, OSF, Open Science Framework, and Dryad. In the middle of the screen, you see re3data.org. re3data.org is the registry of research data repositories. You can visit re3data.org and find a data repository that is appropriate for your type of research data. If you need help finding an appropriate repository, please contact me and I will be happy to work with you on that. If you're a funded researcher, the most important thing to do starting out is know your funders requirements for data sharing, because you'll need to include in your data management plan information about where you're going to share your data. And if you can't share your data, you're going to need to explain that as well. So this is a great time to talk about data management plans. I'm going to wrap up everything we've discussed today with a conversation about data management plans. These are the, the documents that I've mentioned off and on throughout our time together. They are one to two page documents that lay out how you're going to consider all the different concepts that we've discussed today and where you describe how you're going to consistently preserve um, and collect data in a way that makes it accessible to you long term and to others with whom you might need to share it. 
These plans, they're written documents, and they're a required part of the grant application process for lots of federal and private funding agencies. Requirements for data management plans can vary, but generally speaking, you're going to be including some type of description of the types of data that are going to be collected and the formats that you're going to share the data in, or rather save the data in. You're usually going to need to describe your storage and backup method that you plan to utilize. You'll need to describe your metadata standard or data documentation method that you're going to use. You're going to need to describe your plans um, for making your data accessible, if that is appropriate, of where you're going to share your data, how you're going to share your data, and when you're going to share your data. And in some cases, you'll need to discuss the type of data license that you're going to use. A data license tells other people how they're allowed to reuse the data that you've collected. If your data include ethics or privacy concerns, like for example, you have research data with personally identifying information in it, you're going to need to discuss that in your data management plan. If your data cannot be de-identified and then shared, that's where you'll tell the funder about it. And you'll probably need to discuss um, in your data management plan the roles and responsibilities of everybody on the research team with regards to data management. So that's a lot. And you might be wondering, OK, maybe I need to create one of these plans because I'm going to be doing federally funded research. Or maybe I just want to create these one of these plans as a way of keeping myself on track as I do my research. How do I know what to put in my data management plan? Well, luckily, at USC um, and at all over the world, we have access to a really super tool that's called DMP tool. DMP tool is available at dmptool.org. And it contains templates for most funding agencies that helps you write a data management plan that meets your funder requirements. Or if you're writing a data management plan for your own purposes and you don't have a funding agency, they also have templates for that as well. dmptool.org is great. If you want help with using it, um, please contact me and I will be more than happy to walk you through how you can do it. You can even send your draft data management plan to me and I'll review it and send it back to you um, with suggestions for improvement. So these are the concepts that I wanted to cover today. And here is my contact information. As a reminder, my name is Stacy. My email address and office phone number are on the slide. I work at University Libraries in a department called Digital Research Services, and we have a listserv. If you would like to join the listserv and get updates about events, um, news happening um, in the realm of data management, open access, all kinds of stuff, you can scan the QR code on this screen and join the listserv. Thank you so much. And if you have questions about anything that we covered today, I hope that you will contact me. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. Bye-bye.